So welcome everyone to this extraordinary seminar of the Institute. I'm very pleased that Professor Barry Simon for Caltech, who will receive tomorrow the Buya Janos International Mathematical Prize, the single international prize of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. So tomorrow at 3 o'clock, everybody is welcome in the Academy. And we will also give a talk, and we'll be happy to also give a talk there. So we are looking forward to that event, that great event tomorrow in the main building of the Academy. But Professor Simon was very kind to offer us a mathematical historical talk, tales of our forefathers, about famous personalities in, in the history of mathematics, especially in analysis. So we are very happy that you are giving this talk to the audience here. Thank you very much. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, the honor tomorrow is a great honor. Um, and it's, this is a fun talk to give. Um, it will, it's scheduled for an hour and a half. However, I will take a brief pause after an hour for people who thought it was only an hour talk who feel like they want to leave. There are just lots of good stories, so we decided to do it for an hour and a half. Um, this is not a mathematics talk, but it is a talk for mathematicians. It's dedicated to the notion that it would be good that our students realize that while Han Banach refers to two mathematicians, Mittag Leffler refers to only one. While on the subject of names, I can't resist a personal story. In the early 1980s, Mike Reed visited the Quran Institute, and at T, Peter Lax took him over to a student who Lax knew was a big fan of Reed Simon. Now, this is um, Mike Reed, uh, but not in the 1980s. It's probably, oh, close to 10 years ago at his 65th birthday uh, celebration. Uh, Lax, that is Lax, again, not in the 1980s, more recently, to the students said, this is the Reed of Reed Simon. Students' mouth fell open. You're Reed? I thought Reed was Simon's first name. <laughs> I digress, and not for the first time. So the, the, there are four caveats I want to make sure you understand before I get to the good part, all the nice stories. First, I'm not a historian, and I have no faith that everything I'm telling you is true. None of the stories was made up, at least by me. Um, secondly, I regret this is a story only about four fathers, not four mothers. Uh, there are two female mathematicians who have cameos later, but it's of course an unfortunate fact that for most of our history we ignored half of our mathematical talent, and I'm glad we no longer do quite so badly. A third caveat is that I'm an analyst, and I learned many of these stories while working on the notes for a series of analysis texts that I've written, not I'm writing, that appeared last month. Uh, so I'll be focusing on analysts. Of course, prior to the 20th century, mathematicians were more universal. Analysts really meant most mathematicians. This is not only true of transcendent figures like Euler, shown here on a still um, legal um, pen with Frank Bill, and Gauss here shown on a no longer valid pen Deutschmark bill, although I said this at a talk, some German came over to me and said, no, 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 you could take a Deutschmark into any bank in Germany and they, give, they, they recognize the money. Um, or uh, Riemann, who's not on any bill that I'm aware of, uh, for example, you might consider Camille Jordan, um, who made significant contributions to algebra, right? the Jordan normal form, the Jordan Holder sequences, to geometry, the Jordan curve theorem, and to analysis, Jordan content, and the Jordan decomposition of functions of bounded variation, which is sometimes carried over to a statement about decomposition of measures. 
this is not, by the way, this is, Camille Jordan is not the Jordan of Jordan algebras and the Jordan von Neumann theorem. That was the physicist Pascal Jordan, best known as one of the authors of the Drei Mann Arbeit, the three man paper, which was the, one of the foundational uh, papers of quantum mechanics. The other two authors were Heisenberg and Born, shown on stamps here. Born, by the way, in the world at large, is best known for the fact that he's Olivia Newton-John's grandfather. Um, some have speculated that this Jordan might have shared in Born's Nobel Prize if it weren't for his strong support of Nazis and pro-Nazis view during the Hitler era. In fact, after the Second World War, Wolf, Wolfgang Pauli had to work really hard to get Jordan a position because he was in such bad odor. Uh, there's a last caveat. Mostly we remember mathematicians uh, by applying their names to theorems and to mathematical objects. But in this regard, I want to quote two principles which appeared in a 1997 lecture of Arnold that you'll find online. And he actually claims these principles were formulated by Michael Berry. So there's the Arnold principle, which says if a notion bears a personal name, then the name is not the name of the discoverer. And secondly is the Berry principle, that Arnold's principle is applicable to itself. Now, Berry's principle is certainly true. If you search Arnold's principle on Wikipedia, you get a page that's entitled Stigler's Law of Eponomy, which Stigler stated in 1980 as no scientific discovery is named after its original discoverer. He claimed this principle was due to Merton, this, by the way, is not the Nobel Prize winner who does mathematical economics, but his father, who's a celebrated uh, sociologist. And Stigler remarked that since it was a discovery of Merton, it was appropriate to name it Stigler's Law to validate the law. Um, OK, so the first area that I'm going to discuss involves family matters. One thing we lose sight of when we just think of mathematicians as names on theorem is that they're people with parents, children, wives, and in-laws that impact their lives. Particularly interesting are mathematicians with family relationships, father, son, brothers, father-in-law, son-in-law. We start with the largest of the mathematical families. I'm sure everyone here knows who that is, the Bernoullis. Family originally fled Belgium for religious reasons and wound up in Basel sometime before the birth of the generation of the mathematicians. Senior mathematician was Jacob Bernoulli, shown here on a Swiss stamp. It was his younger brother, Johann, and Johann's son, Daniel, and, uh, who was born in Holland, actually. And there were several lesser cousins. There was a Nicholas, there was another Johann, there were probably seven or eight Bernoullis who were significant mathematicians in that era. Jacob was the most significant of them. He's the man who discovered the compound interest formula, the fact that E is the limit of 1 plus N inverse to the nth power. He had Bernoulli trials, the law of large numbers, and he's the Bernoulli of Bernoulli numbers. Much of this famous work actually appeared only posthumously in his uh, book, The Art of Conjecture. Daniel is noted for Bernoulli's principle in hydrodynamics and Johann for contributions to differential equations, for early work in calculus of variations, and as we'll see momentarily for L'Hopital's rule. To use modern parlance, their family was a dysfunctional uh, family, Johann and Jacob were two in a family of 10. Uh, Jacob was Johann senior by 12 years. There was a tremendous jealousy between the two of them. Uh, once Johann got recognition, Jacob said Johann was his student and Johann objected to this. Uh, there was a huge priority fight with them over who solved the isoparametric problem. 
and a total break of relations in 1897. At that point, Jacob became convinced that Johann was plotting to get his chair in Basel. And in fact, when Jacob died shortly thereafter, Johann did get the chair. Um, you may have noticed there was eight years, you probably didn't because it went too fast, between Jacob's death and the publication of the posthumous work, and that was because there was squabbling between Johann and Nicholas over exactly what should appear in the work and uh, who should get credit besides uh, Jacob. The most shocking event, at least to me, involved books on hydrodynamics. In uh, 1738, Daniel, who was Jacob's, uh, was Johann's son, uh, published a book on the subject of hydrodynamics, which was, uh, had he actually largely written in 1734. His father then published a book on the same subject using many of Daniel's ideas, but predated his book claiming his work was er earlier and that Daniel had taken the ideas from him. So uh, I won't try to butcher Mr. the Marquis de L'Hôpital's name, but he was a French uh, nobleman who over many years paid Johann Bernoulli a large annual retainer, initially for personal lectures on the calculus of Leibniz and Newton, and then for continuing advice. In 1896, L'Hôpital published a book, The Analysis of the Infinitely Small for the Understanding of Curved Lines, which was a hit as the first textbook on differential calculus available on the continent. And it contained what has come to be called L'Hôpital's Rule, which we all teach about in freshman calculus. He thanked various people in the preface, including Johann. After his death, Bernoulli claimed the book was close to a verbatim copy of the notes of the lectures he gave to L'Hôpital. He, of course, didn't complain because, before L'Hôpital's death because he was getting paid this annual retainer and he didn't want to uh, annoy his protector. Uh, ironically, given his other priority disputes, and he had lots of them, this claim was dismissed by historians of mathematicians in the 19th century, but in the 1920s, notes of lectures that Johann had given at the University of Basel were found that were indeed almost the same as uh, L'Hôpital's book and had predated it. Undoubtedly, Johann Bernoulli's greatest contributions to mathematics concerned Euler. Uh, I, did, I kicked something. What do I need to do? I do something terrible. Okay. Sorry, I can't put my foot in that direction. Um, so Euler's father and his mother's father were both pastors, and Euler was expected to go into the family business and was to, to get to be pastors in the Swiss church, you actually needed to go to a theological, get a theological degree. So he was sent off to the University of Basel to get such a degree. During his studies, he convinced Johann to give him private lectures. Johann Bernoulli had been a student at the university with Euler's father, and he was able to convince Euler's father to let Euler continue as a mathematician. Uh, and rather than become a pastor. Uh, he was a great physicist and very prolific. It's estimated that about one third of all the research papers in mathematics and physics in the 18th century were written by Euler. There were still papers of his being published by both the Berlin and St. Petersburg academies 50 years after his death. In 1775, at age 68, he wrote over 50 papers. By the way, you shouldn't misunderstand that. I'm not saying that by the time he was 68, he'd written 50 papers. In that one year, he wrote 50 papers. The remarkable thing is that he'd been totally blind for nine years before that. He wrote with the help of scribes 
and mathematical assistants, uh, among them were his son and grandson. And so this is a picture of the blind Euler. Um, he was also the author of textbooks on calculus, mechanics, and many other areas. Some were in use for over 100 years. And he wrote the first great popular book on science, Lessons for a German Princess. Um, he was so prolific that his complete works, uh, not counting the correspondence, run to 72 volumes, uh, each in the 400 to 700 page range. So while we're on the subject of fathers and sons, Karl Weierstrass was the son of a Prussian finance ministry bureaucrat who wanted his son to follow in his footsteps because it was a good living. And uh, he forced him to study <coughs> finance at the University of Bonn. Karl Weierstrass rebelled. Uh, the story is he spent more time in the tavern than in classes. And he quit just short of his degree. There was something of a crisis and a friend stepped in and there was negotiation between the father and son and he was allowed to get a degree from Munster that would allow him to teach mathematics in a gymnasium, which was a higher class than a typical high school, but it was not um, being a mathematics professor. He taught at the gymnasium starting in 1841 and during the 1840s wrote unpublished works that established the Weierstrass approach to complex analysis centered on manipulation of power series. Things like um, the Weierstrass convergence theorem uh, from this era. Many were only published when his complete works were published 50 years later, although he did talk about them during his lectures at the University of Berlin when he was there, that gets ahead in the story. During the summer of 1853, so he'd already been teaching in gymnasium for 13 years, he wrote a paper on elliptic functions. Uh, now you have to realize that in the hands of Abel and Jacobi, the subject had reached mature, maturity about 1830, long before this and was regarded as almost a closed subject. And so his solution of the Jacobi inversion problem for general hyperliptic functions caused a sensation. And later he developed the Weierstrass elliptic functions, which are the way that most textbooks discuss it now. This caused a real sensation. This unknown person was writing this paper that was really regarded as breathtaking. And so the result was that because of this, there were various attempts to make him a university professor. Uh, eventually, he was in fact found a position at the University of Berlin, Berlin where he developed an active school of analysis. Um, his, he had no degree. He had just an undergraduate degree. And this was settled because you couldn't become a professor if you weren't a doctor uh, by arranging for him to get an honorary degree. One of my favorite quotes about Weierstrass is from Korner's book on Fourier analysis, commenting on Fayer's, so for the location uh, commenting on Fayer's uh, theorem on Cesaro summability of Fourier series and Weierstrass's theorem on the density of polynomials. And here's what Cornus said. Fayer discovered his theorem at the age of 19. Weierstrass published his theorem at the age of 70. With time, the reader may come to appreciate why so many mathematicians regard the second circumstance as even more romantic and heartwarming than the first. Fayer was born, in fact, Leopold Weiss. Weiss, I remind you, is German for uh, white. He was born in Hungary and was a student of Hermann Schwartz, which is German for black. Uh, in high school, uh, Fayer changed his name from Weiss to Fayer, which, as you know, is Hungarian for white in part because he expected that with the name change, he'd suffer from less anti-Semitism. Uh, one of his students was Feketer, which, as you know, is Hungarian for black. 
So white, black, white, black, but there was a language change. Among Fayer's other students were a very impressive group. Now, this is the one audience where, you know, I don't have to tell you this, but I will anyways. Um, namely, uh, M. Reese. So the more famous Reese is F. Reese, his, M. Reese's older brother. F. Reese was, and Fayer were students at the same time. M. Reese was a younger brother and was actually a student of uh, Fayer. Um, Polya Zago? Zigo. Zigo. I'm going to mispronounce it. I'm sorry. I, you'll have to just get used to that. Um, von Neumann, Turin, and uh, Erdos. Erdos. While we're on the subject of fathers and polynomial approximation, I note that Marshall Stone, the stone of Stone Viastras, was the son of Holland Stone, who was Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. In fact, uh, at the, during the great fights between Franklin Roosevelt and the courts, um, uh, Holland Stone, who had been appointed by a Republican president, was one of Franklin Roosevelt's actual supporters on the court. I next want to turn to the subject of bastards. Now, here I mean legal, literally bastards. We're going to talk about the other kind of bastard at the end of the talk. So the parents of Stefan Bonach were not only not married, but his mother departed four days after his birth, leaving behind nothing but the name Bonach. So Bonach was his mother's name. Stefan was raised by his father's parents and then by friends of his father. As a teenager, he was left to fend on his own, and uh, he did study a little mathematics, but he only managed a first degree in engineering, because that was easy to get jobs in engineering. His life changed dramatically because of the following um, incident in 1916, when Banach was 24. Hugo Steinhaus, who was five years his senior, um, had been appointed to a professorship in Lvov, but while waiting for the appointment to begin, he was living in Krakow and made a habit of strolling in the evening. And uh, one evening, as he was walking in the park, he heard wafting through the air the words Lebeg Integral. He went to follow the voices, and he found Bana talking with his friend Otto Nicodem. Um, Steinhaus, who regarded Bana as his greatest mathematical discovery, took Bana to Lvov, where first Bana got a graduate degree. His, des his, his official dissertation uh, began what we call now call Bana spaces. And then with Steinhaus, he founded the famous Lvov School and the journal Studia Mathematica. Um, this hundred, I think, Zloty coin is actually worth a lot of money because it's gold. It was actually produced at the time of the International Congress in Warsaw. But uh, Steinhaus was a rather pleasant person. Uh, I was told by Mark Kotz, that's a picture of Mark Kotz, who was a student, that Steinhaus loved stories and uh, little bon mots, and a favorite among the ones that Kotz passed on to me. So Kotz loved to tell me stories about Steinhaus, was the following. Steinhaus used to say, the acceptance of your work by the mathematical public goes through three phases. First, they say it's wrong. Then they say it's trivial. And finally they say I did it first. <laughs> and I once received a letter from someone about some of my work that in the same letter the three phases were essentially there. While we're on the subject of bastards, Jean-Baptiste Laurent d'Alembert was found abandoned in the church of St. John Laurent, that's where his name came from, 
in Paris, and he was named after John the Baptist. That's where you get Jean Baptiste. Um, he had been abandoned by his mother, uh, Claude Tensine, whose literary salon was a social center during the reign of Louis the Fifteenth. Her lovers included Richelieu and uh, Louis de Touche, who was an army officer and was d'Alembert's father. Uh, while neither parent ever officially acknowledged d'Alembert, his father did arrange a foster home, uh, which d'Alembert lived in for almost 50 years. And uh, when he died, the father left d'Alembert a uh, income that allowed him to pursue mathematics rather than uh, law, which he'd officially studied. Um, he discovered the wave equation as describing plucked strings and found the general one-dimensional solution. Uh, he was an editor with Diderot of the Encyclopedia Francaise, which uh, made him a member of the Academy Francaise. Laplace was his student, and according to the stories, he actually had a lot of trouble coping with Laplace's great fame, uh, because Laplace certainly outshone down there. Another famous bastard is Andrei Komogorov. Uh, his mother died in childbirth, and his father had nothing to do with him. He was raised by his mother's sister, and Komogorov was his maternal grandfather's name. However, he didn't have Bonnach's problem with education, because in Soviet Russia, he was able to get an in education, and in fact, his grandfather was quite wealthy, so even if there hadn't been a Soviet revolution, he probably wouldn't have had trouble getting education. He was also of Wunderkind, just as Feyer made a great contribution to Fourier series at age 19. Komogorov was 19 when he found L1 functions on the unit circle, circle whose Fourier series uh, are every, almost everywhere divergent. A few years later, he actually found one that's everywhere divergent. Uh, he, of course, went on to make numerous high-order contributions to probability theory, to dynamics, topology, and computer science. He also had an impressive group of students, but frankly, I think Fayer did a little better. But among his students are Arnold, De Bruchin, Dinkin, Gelfond, and Sinai. So it's a close fight with Fair. Well, not in Hungary, of course. Komogorov was an important player in the Luzan affair of the 1930s. Komogorov's teacher was Luzan, and in turn, Luzan was a student of Egorov. So there's Egorov. We'll see Luzan in a second. So again, my, my idea in this talk is you should actually think of these people as just as people. They had interesting lives. We all just think, oh yeah, Luzan, he had such and such a theorem. Eric, Eric, you know, we all teach their theorems, but we don't know anything about them. Both were victims of the 1930s Stalin reign of terror. Egorov was religious and loudly objected to the Soviet treatment of his beloved Russian church. He was dismissed from his post in 1930 and arrested, and died in the middle of a hunger strike in 1931. So, interesting times is a curse. I mean, it really is true. Egorov, so when you think about Egorov's theorem, remember how he died. Luzan, who's shown here on this picture, was the center of a lively group of younger mathematicians in Moscow in the 20s. Uh, his students and the group around him was known as Lusitania, and his students included Alexandrov, Kinchin, Komogorov, Suslin, and Orizon. Also not a bad uh, collection. He was a powerful figure in the Russian Academy. In 36, he was accused of anti-Soviet behavior and given essentially a show trial before a commission of the academy. And I've heard from several Russians that it was expected that um, he would be likely sentenced to death and that Stalin personally intervened. Why it isn't clear to anyone 
to prevent this happening. Um, he was found guilty but received a mild sentence, basically a loss of power and influence, but it all this whole thing left him a broken man. Among those testifying against him at the trial were Alexandrov, Kinchin, and Komogorov. I think of this as a kind of mathematical patricide. You know, I think of my students as my sons. And it has elements of Greek tragedy. There's widespread speculation about the motivation of Alexandrov and Komogorov in testifying against uh, Luzan. These two were very close. They traveled together and shared a house uh, for 50 years, in fact. Whether they were having a homosexual relationship or only gave the appearance of one, there was a belief they were pressured by the KGB to testify against Luzanne or be arrested for homosexual behavior. The good news is on January 17, 2012, the Russian Academy formally rescinded their motion condemning Luzanne. Littlewood. So, of course, while we're on the subject of bastards, you know, there were two other people involved in the production of a bastard other than the bastard. And in this regard, we should consider Sir John Littlewood. Just as one can't imagine Stan Laurel without Oliver Hardy, one can't imagine John Littlewood without G.H. Hardy. They are arguably the most celebrated and most successful mathematical collaboration ever. At one point, Harold Bohr, so, of course, Harold is the brother of an even more famous uh, physicist, Niels Bohr, um, although in the early years, Harold was much more famous because he was on uh, Denmark's silver medal winning uh, soccer, Olympic soccer team. Um, it's remarkable, when I first went on, on uh, Google Images and found this picture of um, Harold Bohr, I actually thought it was Niels, they really do, this really does look a lot like Niels Bohr, but when you look closely, it's enough different that you're convinced it could be a different form. Uh, at one point, Harold Bohr said, these days there are three great British mathematicians. Hardy, Littlewood, and Hardy Littlewood. Both Hardy and Littlewood were bachelor dons with nice rooms and meals. Uh, there was a tremendous bonus to staying single, so they both did. Um, Littlewood uh, spent his entire career, once his postdoc era ended, in Cambridge. Hardy started. Um, in Cambridge, but during the First World War, he was quite unhappy. The Cambridge was a incredibly jingoistic place. Uh, Russell was dismissed for his pacifism, and Russell had been to friend. And in fact, Hardy left for Oxford because of this in 1919, and preferred Oxford, but he still returned to Cambridge in 1931, because unlike in Oxford, uh, because in Cambridge, unlike Oxford, one could keep one's rooms after retirement. So that's why Hardy returned to Cambridge. Despite being a bachelor in his later years, Littlewood traveled with his niece Anne, who he eventually acknowledged was his daughter. Uh, I have a favorite, probably apocryphal story about Littlewood. Littlewood's later years, uh, he, until his later years, when he was helped by medication, Littlewood suffered from severe depression, and he didn't travel as a result. He just found it very difficult to travel. Hardy, on the other hand, was everywhere dense. He went to all conferences. He was known everywhere on the continent, and therefore widely known personally, unlike Littlewood. There's a story involving a visit to England, in one version, it's Landau who visited, and in the other version, it's Wiener, who, upon meeting Littlewood, exclaimed, Oh, you exist. I thought Littlewood was a pseudonym Hardy used for his weaker papers. <laughs> Next, I want to mention fathers-in-law. Kuma was Schwarz's father-in-law. 
Schwartz's, not Schwartz's, Schwartz's father-in-law. Her meat was Picard's father-in-law. Uh, here is an interesting timeline. Picard got his degree, went off to Toulouse, proved his famous Picard's little and big theorems, and only then returned to Paris and married Hermite's daughter. So Hermite apparently only allowed him to marry his daughter after he'd proven good enough theorems. Uh, Luan Schwartz was Paul Levy's son-in-law, uh, and John Tate is uh, Emile Artin's uh, son-in-law. Courant was the father-in-law of both Jorgen Moser and long after Courant's death, Peter Lacks. Um, and in turn, Courant was the son-in-law of Runga, of Runga Cutter Method, uh, who in turn was married to the niece of uh, Dubois Raymond. <coughs> Schwarz's great uncle was Hadamard, uh, but it appears Hadamard had no mathematical influence other to express dismay that this 16-year-old budding mathematician didn't know what the Riemann zeta function was. Krengsheim, uh, who was actually an interesting complex analyst, was the father-in-law of Thomas Mann, who was, of course, not a mathematician. Uh, Paul Ehrlich, the biologist, was the father-in-law of Edmund Landau, who was, in turn, the father-in-law of Schoenberg, not the musician, but the mathematician. Um, uh, and Schoenberg remarked that you um, inherit your mathematical abilities from your father-in-law. Uh, when he was 30, Emil Borel married the 17-year-old daughter of the mathematician Appel. Uh, besides mathematics, Borel was actually the French minister of the Navy after the First World War, and after the Second World War, he received the Croix Légion d'Honneur for his resistance activities. He was 68 when the war began and still received a uh, award for his resistance activity during the Second World War. Uh, there's a story of a non-mathematical father-in-law um, that... Uh, I want to talk about. So Airy came from a poor background, uh, but managed to get through Cambridge by being a part-time manservant. In 1824, he met and fell in love with Richarda Smith, the daughter of the vicar of Chatsworth. In 1826, uh, at age only 25, he was appointed to the Lucasian Chair of Mathematics. This is arguably the most prestigious chair in science. Among its holders um, were Newton, Dirac, and Hawking, of course, Dirac and Hawking after um, Airy. But Vicar Smith would not allow Airy to marry Richard because the Lucasian chair only paid 100 pounds a year. Fortunately, in 1830, the Plumian Chair of Astronomy, which paid 500 pounds, opened. Airy applied and got it and was allowed to marry Richarda. And he took his new responsibilities seriously enough that he, in fact, eventually became the Astronomer Royal. <coughs> So the next relationship I want to discuss involves wives. So this Grace Chisholm Young studied mathematics in Cambridge with William Young, her tutor. She then went to Guttington and got a degree in 1895 supervised by Felix Klein. Uh, she w returned to England, married her former tutor, whom she encouraged to become active in research. She hadn't before then. Uh, works credited to Young include the, well, he independently discovered Lebesgue integration, but also he's the Young of Hausdorff Young inequalities, Young's convolution inequalities, and Young's inequality for conjugate convex functions. He's not, however, the Young of Young tableau. That's Alfred Young, a clergyman who was not a formal mathematician. 
It's clear that some of Young's work was joint with Grace, but not clear which. He wrote to his wife at one point the following. The fact is that our papers ought to be published under our joint names. But if this were done, neither of us would get the benefit of it. No, mind the laurels now and the knowledge, yours the knowledge only. Everything under my name now and later when the loaves and fishes are no more procurable in that way, everything or much under your name. At present you cannot undertake a public career, you have your children. And one reads this and realizes our sin. Next, I want to talk about Weil and Schrodinger. So Erwin Schrodinger and Hermann Weil were both professors in Zurich in the 20s, and they were coupled scientifically in work on quantum mechanics. By the way, I purposely, because of the rest of this story, picked these three pictures of Weil, but they're in different periods. This dreamy-looking guy is a, it's a picture from about 1912. This, if you will, is the vial of the vial asymptotic formula about the number of eigenvalues. Um, the, this is vial about 1925. This is the vial of the representations of Lie groups and uh, the vial group and uh, the vial integration formula. And um, this is uh, Herman Vial taken while he's at the Institute for Advanced Study. Um, it's the Vial rescue sure Vial theorem, for example. But they were linked not only scientifically. As one biographer of Schrodinger put it, those familiar with the serious and courtly figure of Vial of Princeton would have hardly recognized the slim, handsome young man of the 20s. So think about the last two pictures. Uh, with his romantic black mustache. His wife, Helene Joseph, from a Jewish background, was a philosopher and literateurs. In fact, Weil left Germany because he was worried about his wife being uh, suffering and so he, he moved to the United States precisely because he had a Jewish wife. Her friends called her Heller and a certain daring and insouance made her the unquestioned leader of the social set comprising the scientists and their wives. Annie Schrodinger's wife was almost an exact opposite of the stylish and intellectual Heller, uh, Heller but perhaps for that reason, Weil found her interesting, and before long, she was madly in love with him. The special circle in which they lived in Zurich had enjoyed the sexual revolution a generation before the United States. Extramarital affairs were not only condoned, they were expected, and they seemed to occasion little anxiety. Annie would find in Herman Weil a lover to whom she was devoted body and soul, I'll get the last uh, phrase. So, right, Weil and Schrodinger were not only connected because Weil wrote a book on the mathematical foundations of quantum. The Oppenhoff. We close our tale of families with a love story. Uh, the Oppenhoff is known for his work on stability of ODEs. That's where the Oppenhoff exponents come from and on the central limit theorem. In 1886, he married Natalia Sechenov. He met her as a teenager when he was being tutored by her father, his fairly distant cousin, not first cousin. Uh, he was a student of Chebyshev in St. Petersburg. He took a position in Kharkov and with Chebyshev's death returned to uh, Chebyshev's position in St. Petersburg. In 1917, Lyapunov took a position in Odessa since the doctors thought the climate there was better for Natalia's tuberculosis. Her condition worsened. She passed away on October 31st, 1918. Later that day, the distraught Lyapunov shot himself, dying of his wounds three days later. The next issue I want to turn to involves um, various
strange things about educational degrees. We already saw Via Strauss getting the honorary degree. Um, I'm going to skip most of Dirichlet except to point out that Dirichlet's wife was Felix Mendelssohn's uh, sister, and uh, the Mendelssohn's and Dirichlet's had a Sunday get-together with Jacoby during most of their, so they were very close uh, socially. Um, Bernstein was a Jewish-Ukrainian mathematician known for his work in approximation theory, so Bernstein, the Bernstein polynomials and Bernstein's inequalities, and for his integral representation theorem for completely positive functions. He went to study in Paris and spent three years in Guttington with Hilbert and then submitted a, a thesis in Paris which he defended in 1904. He defended it before a committee of Poincaré, Hadamard, and Picard. So it was a pretty good thesis. It actually solved one of Hilbert's problems, or partially solved it, the um, 19th. There were later parts of the problem that were studied by uh, Hopp, George, and Nash. He then returned to Russia where his PhD wasn't recognized, so before he could teach, he had to be a graduate student and submit a master's thesis. Uh, eventually, he submitted a PhD thesis in Russia, for, which in fact solved a different one of Hilbert's problems. Jensen. So in 2012, I attended a conference in Copenhagen that met in the Danish Academy of Sciences. There was in the room where we were meeting a huge portrait uh, that I could actually find on the internet. So it's the portrait that you see here. And uh, the president of the academy came and pointed out and pointed out a couple of people. And so I said to him, where's Jensen? Because to me, the, the, the greatest Danish mathematician is uh, Jensen. Jensen, Jensen, of course, Ludwig Jensen. He's known for, he, he was a pioneer in the study of convex functions. That's where Jensen's inequality comes from. And Jensen's formula, which is used in complex analysis, is after Jensen. And I was informed that he spent his career as an engineer for the telephone company. I actually knew this. Therefore, he didn't have an advanced degree, and so, of course, he was never elected to the academy. Kotler. So, Misha Kotler is best known for Kotler's lemma, sometimes known as the kotler stein or Kotler-Napstein lemma, which is critical for estimating integral um, and pseudo-differential operators. He actually invented Kotler's lemma to provide uh, L2 bounds on higher dimensional Hilbert transforms. This is very deep harmonic analysis that he did. Here's what Charlie Pfefferman said about his interaction with Kotler when Pfefferman was a postdoc at Chicago and Kotler was almost 60. Kotler was one of the kindest and most self-affecting people I ever met. One of my secret ambitions during the few months we were together in Chicago long ago was to succeed in walking through a doorway after Misha, but rather than letting him hold the door for me, in this I failed. Kotler was born in the Ukraine in 1912. His father was the manager of a local mill. After the revolution, the father, was, who was obviously thoroughly bourgeois, was a pariah, and as a punishment, his children were not allowed to attend school. So Misha had exactly one year of formal school. His father taught him some mathematics and to play the piano. In 1928, the family was able to emigrate to Montevideo, Uruguay. The four of them lived in a single room, so that's his mother, his father, brother, his father sold newspapers at a downtown street corner. His brother was a tramway conductor. And Misha played piano from 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. It says in a rough harbor bar, but I'm sure it was a bordello. 
Not too long after arriving, the senior Kotler came in first in a national chess tournament. And the fact that a member of the lower classes did this caused some news coverage. The articles mentioned that the winner claimed to have a mathematically gifted son. This was noticed by Raphael Laguardia, who was a professor of mathematics and a former student of Picard. He invited Nisha initially to attend the seminar and later to actually teach a course in number theory to his students. He also helped Nisha upgrade his job to playing in a chamber music trio uh, in the fanciest hotel in a seaside resort near Montevideo. In 1934, uh, Milo Ray Pasteur, who had been a student of Felix Klein and was spending half his time in Madrid and half in Buenos Aires, visited Montevideo. Uh, Cotley was drawn to Buenos Aires when he learned more mathematics from Pasteur, and he shifted from earning his living as a pianist to being a tutor of mathematics. He actually got a job for a while as a university, in a university research institute, but was fired after six months when the authorities learned he had no degree. He corresponded with Crochet, who helped him publish a paper, and in 1938, he married Yanni Frankel, another student of Pasteur, uh, and his wife, uh, Frankel was, Lenny Frankel was his wife, uh, until his death 70 years later. In the mid-40s onwards, there were a number of American foundations that sponsored trips by U.S. mathematicians to Argentina to try to upgrade Argentinian mathematics. So Adrian Albert, George Burkhoff, Marshall Stone, and Zygmunt were among the people who visited uh, Argentina. During one of these trips, Zygmunt discovered Calderon, who was at the time an engineer, and brought him to Chicago with money from the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, where Stone convinced them that Calderon should get a degree. Earlier, Burkhoff had met Kotler and had been so impressed by him that he recommended Misha for a graduate Guggenheim Fellowship, which they awarded. Alas, Burkhoff died shortly after he received the letter from the Guggenheim Foundation, and before he had let Kotler know, so the letter was lost among his papers. But they were found and rediscovered by Garrett Burkhoff, George's son, who was, of course, a noted mathematician in his own right, and the initial award was made in 1944. It was only in 1950 that Kotler finally made it to Yale, where he worked with Kakatani and completed a PhD thesis in Ergodic. But when the Yale administration learned he had no prior de degree, they refused to award him a PhD. Marshall Stone, who was a, the chair at Chicago, then stepped in and suggested he should come to Chicago, where he assured him the administration would be more flexible. Kotler insisted on doing a new thesis, which he did, wrote on harmonic analysis under Calderon, and got his degree. He spent much of his career as a professor at Buenos Aires, where he helped nurture the talents of uh, people who got their graduate degrees elsewhere, but Carlos Bernstein and Kurtzman both uh, acknowledge his influence. In 1966, there was a coup by the military junta, uh, which, among other things, ordered beating of students and faculty at the university. Cotton went into exile in Caracas and only returned to Buenos Aires after the return of democracy to Argentina. Okay. So I just want to say something about high school teachers, because we've already seen Bias Josh was a high school teacher. Um, there were many other examples. Uh, I'll just mention them quickly. Kuma, one of his students while he was a high school teacher was in fact Kronika. Um, Hadamad, who <coughs> had uh, Frechet as one of his students in uh, high school. Uh, Lebed, there and never winner 
in fact, Nevin Minna developed his value distribution theory while a high school teacher. Uh, his, his theory of 1925 made a big splash, and he was shortly afterwards made a professor at the University of Helsinki, where he became rector in 1941. He cooperated with the Nazis and was chair of the support committee for the Finnish branch of the Waffen SS. After the war, he was dismissed as rector and spent some time in Zurich, in part because he was not regarded in high repute in Helsinki because of his Nazi connections. His defenders claim he was not so much pro-German as anti-Russian. He had fought in the Finnish-Russian War after the First World War and morally supported Finland in its 1939 war with Russia. He was later rehabilitated enough to become president of the ICM. Still, I am among those who question the appropriateness of an ICM prize named in honor of the head of the support committee of the Waffen SS, Finnish Waffen SS. Although the reason the prize was named after him is somebody gave money named the prize after him. Fourier. Some mathematicians are either unappreciated in their lifetimes or even now. Uh, Fourier was more an engineer and physicist than a mathematician. Uh, because of his practical abilities, he actually had high political appointments. He went to Egypt with Napoleon and ended up as governor of Lower Egypt. He spent many years as the, essentially the governor of the uh, uh, of the province that includes Grenoble and was responsible for the building of the Turin Grenoble Highway. He wound up eventually being made a baron. Uh, here is a coffee cup. He's, of course, best known for his book on heat flow, which includes both Fourier series and transforms. He submitted it to the French Academy in 1807. A committee of Lagrange, Laplace, Monge, and Lacroix questioned the notion of expanding any function in Fourier series. And it was only in 1822 that the book was finally published. So the next time you submit a paper to the annals, and it's five years later, right? this was 15 years. In 29, of course, Fourier student Dirichlet actually proved that an a piece yc1 function has a conversion Fourier series. So he justified his mentors. Fourier also studied Egyptian history while in Egypt. Uh, and here's what Corner says in his book. I, Corner has lots, it's a nice book, his book on Fourier analysis, but it's lots of great stuff. Apart from his prefectorial duties, Fourier helped organize the description of Egypt. Fourier's main contribution was the general introduction of survey of Egyptian history up to modern times. An Egyptologist with whom I discussed this described the introduction as a masterpiece and a turning point in the subject. He was surprised to hear that Fourier also had a reputation as a mathematician. I think I'm going to skip cancer. So, uh, Lebeguin Schwartz revolutionized analysis. As Strickart says in his analysis text, um, distribution theory was one of the two great revolutions in mathematical analysis in the 20th century. It can be thought of as the completion of differential calculus, just as the other great revolution in measure theory can be thought of as the completion of integral calculus. There were many parallels between the two revolutions. Both were created by young, highly individualistic mathematicians, the Belgian Schwartz. Both were rapidly assimilated and opened up new worlds of mathematical development. Both forced a complete rethinking of all mathematical analysis that had come before and basically altered the, nation, the nature of the questions the mathematical analysts ask. I really think it's a wonderful paragraph. It's not quite correct. So it's a question of what you mean by rapidly assimilated. It took 10 years 
in that sense, it wasn't that long. But there was actually, for both cases, uh, it was certainly not overnight. Hermes dismissed Lered's work as insignificant, and as for Schwartz, Trev, who was Schwartz's student, tells the following story in his obituary for Schwartz. In 1948, Laurent Schwartz visited Sweden to present distribution theory to the local mathematicians. He had the opportunity of conversing with Marcel Ries, who, as you know, was Hungarian, but spent most of his career in Sweden because the job market in Hungary was so bad. Um, having written on the blackboard, oh, sorry, he had, I'm sorry, having written on the blackboard the integration by parts formula to explain the idea of a weak derivative, he was interrupted by Ries saying, I hope you have found something else in your life. Later, Schwartz told Reese of his hopes that the following theorem would eventually be proven. Every linear partial differential equation with constant coefficients has a fundamental solution, a concept that is made precise and general by distribution theory. Madness, explained Reese. This is a project for the 21st century. Of course, the general theorem was proven by Aaron Price and Malgrange only a couple of years later. Part of the irony is that Reese's students, Gording, who's shown here, and Hormander, used distribution theory to reformulate and study quantum field theory and PDEs, respectively. So this visit by Schwartz, which Reese was clearly not impressed by, did have an impact. In it. And Reese did eventually become a big supporter of it. Kelly is underappreciated and a paradigm for may you live in interesting times being a curse. In 1912, while he was another high school teacher, he wrote a brilliant paper about the continuous function on zero one. He proved the Hahn-Banach theorem for this case. Uh, they did their work only 10 years later, and he used the argument that works for general separable Banach spaces which of course had not been defined at that point. That is, he found the induction step, but there wasn't yet transfinite induction, so he couldn't do the general infinite dimensional uh, case. That's really what Hahn and Banach did. He also proved sequential weak compactness of the unit ball in the measures in this same paper. <coughs> This is the precursor of the banach alaglu theorem, and Alaglu's work was only done 25 years later. So this is a brilliant 1912 paper. So why is he better known? Well, in 1914, he enlisted, serving as a lieutenant in the Austrian army. In 1915, he was shot in a lung and captured by the Russians. He spent the next few years in a hospital and a prison in Siberia, and he suffered from the young injury and strain on his heart for the rest of his life. Even after the Russian involvement in the World War ended, he was not repatriated because the Civil War in Russia made travel across Russia difficult. He only returned to Vienna in 1920. While he was able to get a habilitation, he couldn't get a paid academic position his wife believed this was because he was Jewish and because Han, yes, the Han of Han Banach, uh, who was himself Jewish, favored someone younger than a person 15 years past his doctorate. Helly found a position in a bank, but it failed in the Depression in 1929, but eventually he found work as an actuary. After the Nazis occupied Austria, he at least had the good sense to flee, but, uh, and he wound up in the United States. Things actually improved because Einstein, who actually did help a lot of refugees get jobs, obtained a position, a teaching position for him in a community college, and uh, then a position writing mathematics training manuals for the Signal Corps. Uh, finally, he was offered a mathematics professorship at the Illinois Institute of Technology, but died of a heart attack shortly after he began that position. 
20 minutes or something. Uh, there are those who think that Maurice Frege was a pivotal figure in 20th century mathematics. Agnes Taylor, who spent his career at UCLA, of course he got his PhD at Caltech, is among them, and I am sympathetic to their point of view. Why? In his 1906 thesis, Frege defined metric space. He didn't have the triangle inequality, but a number of alternatives that included the triangle inequality as one example. He had some inequality on relating the distance between A and B to the distance between A and C and C and B, but it wasn't always the just triangle inequality. It was, in fact, F. Reese who focused on the, but he had this idea. Why is this work so important? Before Fauché, analysts studied either individual functions or subsets of Rn. Hadamard and some Italian analysts had considered the continuous functions on 0, 1 as the space, but that's as far as they went. Fauché defined his metrics on an arbitrary set abstraction which has been so successful in modern mathematics and not just in analysis had its root in Frechet's work. One can make the claim that the notion of studying abstract objects rather than only concrete objects is due to Frechet. So why has he gotten credit? For one thing, his initial idea became so accepted that we can't recall there always being there. I did promise to stop uh, an hour in to give people a chance to leave, so anyone... Um, that we can't recall it wasn't always there. Secondly, his contributions are conceptual rather than solving some long open problem or proving some big theorem although he did independently of F. Reese prove the theorem about the dual of an inner product space. Finally, his contributions to the foundations of topology were downplayed by Bourbaki relative to Hausdorff's 1914 book. I end my discussion of Frechet Fre with dueling quotes, the first from Doudinet, <coughs> his comment to Taylor, <coughs> about the naming of Frechet spaces. Houdinet, by the way, is the one who was presumably responsible for Bourbaki's downplaying uh, Frechet's work in uh, topology. Frechet was always striving for generality without caring for application. And this was thoroughly repugnant to the Bourbaki spirit where no notion could be accepted if we could not be convinced that it was useful in some classical problem. Although many readers, for lack of background, did not realize this. Nevertheless, we thought Frechet's name deserved to be attached to those spaces, these are what we call Frechet spaces, not so much because of his 1926 paper, but because of his 1906 thesis. The second is from a letter which Alexandrov wrote when he was 71 to the 89-year-old Frechet, uh, addressed to uh, my master, dear master and friend, what is your place and role? It is a place among the greatest mathematicians of our time. It is the role of the true master. We end with death. So that's the last topic I'm going to do. So it isn't such a downer, I begin by noting that many mathematicians have lived to ripe old ages, 70s, 80s, 90s, and even over 100. Indeed, Oletzko, as quoted in Derbyshire's Prime Obsession, said, it was said that whoever proved the prime number theorem would attain immortality. Sure enough, both Hadamard and de Valet poussin lived into their late 90s, it may be, there's a corollary here, it may be that uh, the Riemann hypothesis is false, but should anyone manage to actually prove its falsehood, 
to find a zero off the critical line, he will be struck dead on the spot and his result will never become known. Indeed, Hanamad lived to age 97. This was old enough so that he saw he had sons who died in each of the world wars. Uh, and Duvalet Poussin, who was also a baron in his later years, uh, lived to 95. And uh, Erdos and Selberg, <coughs> who are known for the first <coughs> quote-unquote elementary proofs meaning without complex analysis of the prime number theorem, he would live to ages 83 and 90, respectively. The irony of the quote is that Oletzko has done computer searches to find zeros off the critical line. As we know from Schramm's death, accidental death is still with us. Perhaps the strangest accidental death of a mathematician was Jürgen Graham. This is the Graham of Graham Schmidt. Uh, he was walking to an academy, Danish academy, meeting when he was struck by a bicycle and killed. Uh, I think of Graham when watching bicycles whizzing by in Copenhagen. I'm sure you've walked along the street in Copenhagen and these bicycles have just come whizzing. And I think of poor Graham. Uh, Pavel Urizone was noted for his proof that any second countable normal topological space is metrizable, uh, during which he used what has come to be called Urizone's lemma, which he's presumably most famous for. In 1924, <coughs> when he was 26, he and his friend Alexandrov traveled to Gottingen in Paris and went on to vacation <coughs> in Brest on the coast of France. While swimming, he was swept off by a wave and perished at the age of 26. Raymond Paley did remarkable research in harmonic analysis with Littlewood and with Polya and with Zygmunt in Cambridge. He went to the U.S. to work with Wiener. Uh, so this is the Polya of Polya and Zygmunt and Littlewood Polya theory and uh, sorry, Paley Zygmunt. And uh, he went on a skiing vacation in Banff, where he was killed in an avalanche, also at age 26. Uh, modern medicine can be best appreciated by thinking about deaths in the 19th and early 20th centuries that would likely have been avoided with current technology. Abel, Eisenstein, and Riemann died of lung ailments at ages 26, 29, and 39. The first two were tuberculosis. Um, Riemann was probably a form of uh, pleurisy. Uh, Stilchis died at age 38, although I've been unable to find out what the cause was other than an illness. And in the friendship with Wikipedia has a claim not, not to make it. I've talked to some historians of science. Minkowski died at age 44 of a burst appendix, the kind of thing that's serious even nowadays, but almost always treated. Uh, what's perhaps most amazing about Riemann is that he was, he has only about a dozen papers in his entire career, several of them posthumous. There are six monumental papers each of them has so much in it that you can't believe it. So one single paper discussed the Riemann integral. It was as a lead-in to study Fourier series, and it had later on the riemann lebesgue lemma and the Riemann local convergence theorem. So the, the definition of the Riemann integral was as part of studying Fourier theories. Uh, another had basic complex analysis. So the Cauchy-Riemann equation, the removable singularity theorem, the Riemann mapping theorem, Riemann surfaces are all in one paper. Um, a single paper has all of Riemannian geometry from the definition of a Riemannian metric to geodesics and Riemann curvature. There's a celebrated short paper on the Riemann zeta function and of course it's a 
functional equation and the Riemann hypothesis and his vision of the complex analytic view of the distribution of primes. There are papers on higher dimensional theta functions and riemann rach and the Riemann approach to hypergeometric functions. Hilbert's tribute to Minkowski is worth quoting in full. Since my student years, Minkowski was my best, most dependable friend. He supported me with all the depth and loyalty that was so characteristic of him. Our science, science which we loved above all else, brought us together, it seemed, to its garden full of flowers. In it, we enjoyed looking for hidden pathways and discovered many a new perspective that appealed to our sense of beauty. And when one of us showed it to the other, we marveled over it together. Our joy was complete. He was, for me, a rare gift from heaven, and I must be grateful to have possessed that gift for so long. Now death has suddenly torn him from our midst. However, what death cannot take away is his noble image of our heart and the knowledge that his spirit continues to be active in us. Hilbert then spent most of the next year um, organizing um, Minkowski's work on convex functions, uh, which he's very well known for, but much of it was unpublished. Finally, I come to the bastards. I promise to talk about the figurative bastards. Uh, I turn to the depressing view of what Hitler, Stalin, and their systems did to various mathematicians. Those who fell victim to the Nazis are numerous. I want to focus on two of them, Felix Hausdorff and Isaiah Schur. Hausdorff was an urbane Jew he had more of a name in literature and philosophy where he used the synonym Paul Mangra. In the early 1930s, there was a book published, ironically, on German-Jewish cult culture, and Hausdorff was not listed among famous uh, German-Jewish mathematicians, but he was listed under the name Mangra as German Jewish, celebrated German Jewish philosophy. Um, especially prior to moving from Leipzig to Bonn in 1910, he hadn't really done anything that significant. There, a mathematician named Study, who was a student of Karateadori, got him interested in geometry, and within a few years he had axiomatized topology, found the precursor to the Bonnock-Tosky paradox, invented Hausdorff metric measure and dimension. As the 30s progressed, things got progressively worse. He was dismissed from his position in 1935. On January 25th, 1942, Expecting to be picked up for deportation to camps in the East, Hausdorff, his wife, and her sister took overdoses of barbiturates and died. Isaiah Schur was a Jewish mathematician for many years a professor in Berlin. His contributions to mathematics are well known. In the early 1930s, he turned down several invitations to leave Germany thinking this was Germany and they would come to their senses. In 33, he was dismissed from his position, and in 38, he was pressured to resign from the Prussian Academy. Um, Bibabach, so I want to emphasize that Bibabach, Teifler, and Blaschke are among names that should be cursed. Um, they were thoroughly evil in what they did to other mathematicians. Bibelbach remarked, I find it surprising that Jews are still members of academic commissions. Uh, I will tell you a story I heard from, I forget who, but about Vago uh, and Blaschke. And the story is that Vago gave a complex analysis talk in Stanford, uh, course in Stanford, and kept talking about products. And 
Finally, a student came up to me and said, Where's the data? Everybody else calls them Blaschka products. Why do you call them products? Zenko looked at who was one of the gentlest people ever, looked at him and said, I will not say that man's name. And Teichmuller and Liebebach were definitely worse than that. The following story is told by Schiffer, which illustrates the isolation and humiliation suffered by someone like Schur. Schur told me that the only person at the Mathematical Institute in Berlin who was kind to him was Grinsky, then a young lecturer. Long after the war, I talked to Grinsky about that remark, and he literally started to cry. You know what I did? I sent him a postcard to congratulate him on his 60th birthday. I admired him so much and was very respectful in that card. How lonely he must have been to remember such a small thing. In 39, he was offered the ability to leave Germany for Palestine, but had to pay such a large exit tax that he had no money left. He was unable to find a position in Palestine, where there were at the time only uh, one or two academic institutions, depending on whether you think of the Technion, which at the time was an engineering high school as an academic institution. And, you know, there were no professorships left at Hebrew University. And he essentially was destitute, poor, and spiritually broken, and he died in 1941. Felix Nurter. Felix was the brother of Emmy Nurter, so that's the second woman with the cameo. Emmy is justly more celebrated, but Fritz made one great discovery. In 1921, he realized certain singular integral equations were non-compact, but had an integer invariant, their index. Thirty years later, in, that, in others' hands, this blossomed to the theory of Fredholm operators, which was custom-made for Gelfand de Tia and Singer ten years after. Both Emmy and Fritz had German positions from which, as Jews, they were dismissed in 1934. Emmy went to the U.S. and died of cancer a year later. Fritz went to Tomsk. In 1937, he was accused of being a German spy and in prison. In 1941, he was shot for anti-Soviet propaganda. But the good news is, in 1988, the Supreme Court of the Soviet Union officially exonerated him. Um, I really love, so I will, this is almost the end. So it, this is, of course, Fritz. This is the whole family. Their father was a fairly well-known uh, physicist. And I really like this picture of Emmy. It's much nicer than the usual picture you see. The gracious young woman. I hope you learned uh, that our forefathers are fascinating as people, and when you get a new theorem and you hear somebody's name, when you're writing the theorem in your notebook, you'll consider consulting Mr. Google or Ms. Wikipedia to look up them up and find out more about them. And now a word from our sponsor. So. <clears throat> About one month ago, the AMS published a series of five volumes uh, called A Comprehensive Course in Analysis. There's part one, which is called Real Analysis, part two, which is Basic Complex Analysis, part 2B, actually, it's 2A and 2B, so it's, it's four parts for five volumes. It's called Advanced Complex Analysis. There's Harmonic Analysis, there's Operator Theory, uh, a mere 3,200 pages, and um, it's twice the size of Reed Simon, but the price, the member's price on the AMS website is half what Reed Simon costs on Amazon, so it's a big bargain. Um, anyhow, I, I really think these books are fun. They were fun to write, and I hope they'll be fun to read. I want to at least make sure you know about them. 
Uh, you can now order them from Amazon, although again, if you're, an, if you're an AMS member or I believe EMS members can claim uh, reciprocal rights, you can get a better price on the AMS website. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Simon, for this wonderful tour in the history of mathematics, these interesting stories. I don't think this is such a kind of a lecture where we can ask questions. Well, I'll ask anybody who has a question. I'm glad to answer it. But. Okay. Yeah. No, no. I didn't mention lots of famous mathematicians. So I, am the, I have gotten complaints from other places. You didn't mention, right? So I agree, I should particularly, I mean, you know, I'm getting a prize named in, after him tomorrow. I should have added something about him to the talk. But this is a talk I've given many times and I've decided not to add people merely because someone, but, All right, thank you very much.